This episode of Ask Dr. Mujajati is brought to you by Mika Group of Hotels. Hello and uh, welcome to Ask Dr. Mujajati with me, your host, Dr. Mujajati. Today we are discussing lumbar puncture. Is lumbar puncture safe? Do people die after doing a lumbar puncture? Has anybody become paralyzed because of lumbar puncture? When the name lumbar puncture comes up, it's like you've dropped a bomb and people get afraid. Uh, in hospitals, it's even worse. A lot of people get very scared when you raise the issue of lumbar puncture. So to, to set the stage for this topic, we went out in the street to hear from yourselves what you thought about lumbar puncture. And here's what some of you had to say about lumbar puncture. You are watching Ask Dr. Mujajati. It's just uh, safe. Maybe some way back, we didn't have experienced uh, doctors who could uh, uh, do that. But this time, I've seen a lot of people undergo a lumbar puncture and they are still alive, they are still okay. Well, it's a 50-50 thing, like I've said, because, um, you know, a lumbar puncture, it's, they get the fluid direct from your spine, which is a, it's not easy to go through. I wouldn't be comfortable doing a lumbar puncture because it's very painful. And for you to survive it, sometimes it's just the grace of God that you have to go through that for you to survive it. You are watching Ask Dr. Mujajati. You've heard for yourselves some of the views from some of yourselves concerning lumbar puncture. Some of the views expressed were of serious concern. Some were very interesting, I must say. Now, let's get into this topic. What is a lumbar puncture? So a lumbar puncture is basically a medical procedure. It's a medical procedure that allows us to collect a sample, and this is the fluid in which your brain and your spinal cord is suspended for us to go and test. So the way we do the procedure, which we will show you later on in the show, we'll demonstrate, is that we put an injection in your lower back and we draw the water from your lower back and we take it for testing. Now, the first question everyone asks is that, Doc, why do you do the lumbar puncture? Why don't you just draw blood and test? Now, there's a very important structure in the human body that you need to appreciate. Is that there's a barrier between your blood and your brain. And that barrier is called the blood-brain barrier. That barrier stops the brain from interacting with your blood or your immune system. As far as your immune system is concerned, your brain does not exist. Now, let me, let me explain that a bit further. When you are born as a person, your immune system goes to learn or to distinguish between self and non-self. That's a very important education that your immune system has to go through. Because if your immune system cannot distinguish between self and non-self, it will start attacking self. Because it cannot tell that this is not me. So as far as your immune system is concerned, the, the, the immune system was not exposed to your brain. And some of the other parts of the body where the immune system was not exposed to are things like your eyes. So as far as your immune system is concerned, your eyes don't exist. The other parts of the body are the testicles. As far as the immune system is concerned, the testicles do not eh, exist. If you expose the immune system to testicles, the immune system will attack them the way it would attack a bacteria. You soon have no testicles, you have no generation, you have no children. It's the same thing with the brain. Now, what happens is that we have a barrier called the blood-brain barrier. So if there's an infection in the brain, if, if we tested the blood, it's very difficult to know what disease is in the brain. Why? Because there's no interaction between the two sides. So the easiest way and quickest way to know what type of infection is in the brain, we have to do a lumbar puncture. Why? Because the brain and the spine are suspended in water. 
Now, have you ever tried to lift a heavy object underwater? It's very easy to lift a heavy object underwater. That principle where it's very easy to lift a heavy object underwater is the same principle why you don't feel this, the weight of your brain above your head because of the water that is keeping your brain suspended. If that water wasn't there, you'll be feeling like you're carrying a very heavy object and your neck would actually be under a lot of pressure just to support your head because your brain is quite heavy as well. And that's precisely why you don't feel the weight of your brain because your brain and your spinal cord are suspended in water. Now, when there's an infection in that area of the body, it's very difficult to test the blood. So the quickest way is to go in and get that water in which the brain is suspended and we're able to test quickly and find out what is wrong with you. Now, the question is, why do we need to move so fast? Because the brain and the immune system, there's that separation and the, your blood, there's that separation. Any infection in the brain is an emergency. If you don't move very fast, the patient will surely die. If you take, for example, a disease like meningitis, which we are going to discuss in another episode, we'll go through meningitis and all the different types. But for the purposes of this discussion, if you take meningitis, for example, take bacterial meningitis, for example, if you have that disease in the brain, it tends to move very fast and you're racing against time. If you don't figure out what is exactly is going on in the brain, your patient will surely die from the disease itself. Now, meningitis is on different types. You have bacterial meningitis. You also have fungal meningitis. The two types of diseases are different. Even the drugs we give are different. You cannot give the drugs we give to treat a bacteria and give it to a, someone who has a fungus growing in the brain. And so guesswork doesn't work in this scenario because you are racing against time. Some people always argue and say, oh, doc, if you know that, then why don't you just give somebody both antifungals and also, you know, uh, give them um, uh, antibiotics at the same time. You forget one very important thing. Some of these drugs are too powerful. You can't just throw them around like that. So that's why you have to be precise. And because of that, you are moving against time. You have to be quick to make a decision. And that is why a lumbar puncture is critical. So when your doctor says, Madam or Sir, your patient is very sick, we need to do a lumbar puncture to quickly figure out what is wrong. When you say no, you are basically delaying diagnosis, you are delaying treatment, and you are taking matters into your own hands. Now, usually what happens is this. Part of the reason people are afraid of lumbar puncture is because they have observed somebody who has died after a lumbar puncture was done. But people forget also that the patient had a very, very serious condition like meningitis. Usually, if you go back, any one of you who has observed the patient who died after a lumbar puncture, if you go back and if your memory can serve you right now, go back and check, the patient must have been very sick and lumbar puncture was delayed. Because don't forget that meningitis is extremely dangerous. And that's what we forget. Meningitis is extremely, extremely dangerous. Now, later on, I will show you how a lumbar puncture can actually kill a patient. Not what you observed. Then you will, you will be able to distinguish yourself and see whether the person you observed did die of a lumbar puncture or not. Having said that, there are other reasons we do a lumbar puncture. Number one, I've been explaining that we do a lumbar puncture to figure out what type of infection you have. The other reason we do a lumbar puncture is to administer drugs. There are some of you women who have undergone a cesarean section. You know that cesarean section where you were awake, you were wide awake, you're even hearing what the doctors are talking about. Uh, you know, they didn't even put you to sleep, but you were numb from the waist going downwards. And before they even did the, the, the cesarean section, they injected something on your back. What do you think that was? That was a lumbar puncture. And then pregnant women undergo this procedure, especially those who do cesarean sections, a lot more than any other person. But we never hear that, oh, a pregnant woman died because they were injected on the back. 
So where does the fear come from? Already I'm addressing this issue, slowly, slowly, this issue of lumbar puncture kills. Because if indeed it kills, then we should have been hearing a lot of women dying because of being injected on the back. Because how many cesarean sections do you think happen in this country where people are injected on the back? Plenty. The other reason we do a lumbar puncture, we've talked about trying to find out what the disease is. We've talked about uh, in pregnant women where, you know, we are trying to, uh, uh, to numb the waist going downwards in order to facilitate a cesarean section. The other reason we do a lumbar puncture is that a lumbar puncture itself is treatment. Let me explain. You have patients who have what we call high pressure in the brain. And that high pressure sometimes can be caused by a fungal infection or an infection called a fungus. Now, that particular infection can cause the water that I was talking about earlier to start accumulating and putting pressure on the brain. Now, if you don't remove that water, that water will keep accumulating in the, in the head and crush the brain and kill the patient. So the way we do it is that we have to remove the excess water. So we do a lumbar puncture to remove that excess water to save the life of a patient. I can give you stories of patients where we did 14 to 15, 16 lumbar punctures in a week just to save someone's life. Because these are patients who end up with a headache that does not respond to any painkiller. This is a headache that only responds to a lumbar puncture. So you have to go in, remove the fluid, and then the headache goes away. You go in the next day, you find the water has accumulated again, you go in, you remove, and that's how you continue to treat the patient like that until the disease is fully treated and patient goes home. If you don't do those lumbar punctures, it doesn't matter how many drugs you give to such a particular patient, they will still die, unfortunately. That's the sad part of it, and that's the reality of it. So having said that, I think we've already given you three scenarios where a lumbar puncture is done. Number one, lumbar puncture is done to figure out what type of disease you have. Number two, lumbar puncture is done to administer drugs. And the best example I can give you, the commonest example I can give you, is in, a, in pregnant women. We inject them on the back when we're trying to do a cesarean section where you're not asleep. The other drugs that we give are in cancer patients, especially in children of cancer of the brain or different cancers. We inject uh, drugs through that area to, to treat cancers. So that uh, procedure can also be done to administer drugs. The third reason is that the procedure itself is treatment, especially if you are treating high pressure in the brain. And if you don't, people surely die regardless of the drugs that you give. So, that's what a lumbar puncture is about. Now, how is a lumbar puncture done? A lumbar puncture is a very sterile procedure, and uh, in a short while, I will be demonstrating how to do a lumbar puncture. So, join me as we demonstrate how to do a lumbar puncture. So welcome, and uh, we are now going to demonstrate to you how a lumbar puncture is done. So the first thing we do is to explain to our patient what the procedure we're going to do, the risks involved in the procedure, the benefits of doing the procedure, and the patient should consent. So in this particular instance, we've already explained to our patient that we're going to do a lumbar puncture. We've also explained why we are going to do it. We've also explained the benefits of doing it, and the patient has already consented. So in this particular scenario, having done that, then we proceed to do the procedure itself. So lumbar puncture is done in two positions. So I'm going to show you the two positions that we use to do lumbar puncture. You can do it in a sitting position like this. You can also do a lumbar puncture in a lying down position. The first thing you do, is to clean the area where you are going to do the lumbar puncture from. So as a doctor, first of all, you wear gloves, very important. So my assistant here is assisting me with my gloves, so I wear gloves. Now, gloves, we use clean gloves, sterile gloves, but preferably sterile gloves, um, because this is a very sensitive procedure, so we wear sterile gloves. So the first thing we do is position the patient. 
So in this particular instance, we want the patient to bend over slightly, and then we expose the area where we are going to do the lumbar puncture. So the area is exposed nicely. The first step we do is to clean. So sir, I'm going to clean your back. You'll feel a bit cold, but there's nothing that you're going to feel like itching or anything like that. But should you feel anything unusual, please let me know. But expect, expect to feel cold because the chemicals we are using are a bit cold on the skin. So we start with spirit. So we get spirit and we clean the area with spirit. When we are done cleaning with spirit, we also clean with iodine. We take iodine and clean with iodine the area. After you clean the whole area with iodine and you've cleaned everything, then what you want to do is go over the area with spirit again. So we get a spirit swab. We clean all over the place with spirit to remove the iodine that we had put. So remember, we cleaned first of all with spirit. We then cleaned with iodine. And then we've also cleaned with um, spirit. So having done that, the patient is properly positioned. What you want to do is you want to mark the area where the needle is going to go. So in this instance, we look for the highest position of the west bone or the pelvic bone. Once we reach that area, we put our fingers across to mark the spot where we're going to do the lumbar puncture. Now, if you see my fingers here, anything, if I go above this, my finger here is dangerous because all of this area, you have the spinal cord. Below my finger here, there's no spinal cord. So even if I inject anywhere below this area, I will not hit the spinal cord. So that said, then what we do is that having identified the area where we're going to inject, we get our needle. Now, ideally, you, they are what we call spinal needles that we use. So we get our spinal needle and we mark our area that we had marked earlier. And then we tell the patient, sir, we are about to inject. And then you slowly go in and you inject and then you get your fluid. Once you get your fluid, that fluid is labeled and sent to the lab. This is one position that you can use to uh, do a lumbar puncture. Now, there's a second position that you can use to do a lumbar puncture. This is the lying down position. The one that most people talk about when they say, hey, but I'm a pete, I will call spito. Now we will show you what we, the position that we take. So sir, could you lie down on your side? So this is the position we put the patient in and we tell the patient to fold their legs, fold your legs as, as high as you can. Yes, as high as you can. Now, this is the position the patient takes, all right? So you want the head to be inside as much as possible. This is the fetal position. The procedure is the same in terms of cleaning, like we had demonstrated. In terms of where you inject, you use the same markers, okay? And then you put the patient in this position. Now, because you don't want the patient to move, sometimes you may have an assistant hold the patient for you like that. And because your assistant is holding the patient for you on the opposite side like that, some of you who have seen this procedure, you've been complaining that, but that's really not the case. The idea is that we want the space of the spinal bones to be as separate as possible. So when the patient is in this position, we clean again like we had cleaned earlier, and then we inject, we get our fluid. Now, when the patient is done with the lumbar puncture, when you finished, you make them lie down. So, sir, straighten your legs. Make them lie down for a few minutes because you don't want them to get a headache, okay? But otherwise, the fluid that we take, like I showed you, is a very tiny amount of fluid and it should not cause any problems to the patient. And that is how lumbar puncture is done. So, in future, if you see anybody or any health worker asking you to do a lumbar puncture, consider it because it's a very safe procedure. It doesn't kill anyone. And like I keep saying, lumbar puncture is not dangerous, but it is the disease for which we are trying to diagnose.
Welcome back. You are watching Ask Dr. Mjajati with me, your host, Dr. Mjajati. And uh, right now we are going to bust some myths relating to lumbar puncture. To set us off, here's the first one. Lumbar puncture is extremely painful. Okay. Uh, on this one, okay, the procedure is painful. But to say extremely painful is a bit of an exaggeration, but yes, it is painful. So this one, I would say it's not a myth. It is a fact. It is painful, but to say extreme, we are, a bit, we, are, we are stretching the fact. Remember that pain depends on the person. So it depends on the perception of pain for the person who is affected. For some people, they feel it's extremely painful. For others, yes, the, the pain is there, but they wouldn't describe it as extreme. The second issue, lumbar, lumbar puncture causes paralysis. Okay, this one, when done correctly, this is a myth. Because if you look at the area where we inject when we are doing lumbar puncture, there's no spinal cord there. Uh, if you know the, 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 the spinal cord itself, when it is damaged at any point, uh, someone can get hands paralyzed or legs paralyzed or both hands and legs paralyzed. But the point at which we inject to do the lumbar puncture, there is no spinal cord in that area of the back. So this is a myth. But this is this has a condition. The condition here is that if it's done correctly, this is a myth. Lumbar puncture can damage the spinal cord. This relates to the previous one. In the sense that if the lumbar puncture is done correctly and it is done in the correct place, there is no way it can damage the spinal cord because there's no spinal cord in that area. So the two are somewhat related. So this one is also a myth. The fourth issue here is Lumbar puncture is not needed if there is a more advanced diagnosis or diagnostic procedure. I would say, I would say this is a fact because if I have a procedure that I can do or there's a test that can be done um, and lumbar puncture is, can be avoided, um, yeah, this, this would pass as a fact for me. If there's a, an alternative to lumbar puncture and it will give me the same, if not better, uh, results, then I'd go for that one. So, th so this one uh, depends on what is available. So this one is a fact. The next one is lumbar puncture is not needed in emergency situations. Um, okay, for this one, we, we needed to clarify what we meant by emergency situations. Uh, because there are times when a lumbar puncture is actually an emergency. Especially, remember when I was talking about, or when we discussed the issue of where lumbar puncture is needed or is used to reduce the pressure in the brain, that can also be considered an emergency. So, in this particular scenario, it depends on the condition. But, however, in most cases... Um, it, it may not be necessarily be an emergency. But again, if somebody has a certain type of bacterial infection in their brain, this becomes an emergency as well at the same time. So for me, largely speaking, this would pass as a fact as well. Um, no, no, this would not pass as a fact. This would pass as a myth because there are situations where a lumbar puncture may be needed in an emergency situation. Lastly, lumbar puncture is a death sentence. <laughs> this one, this one is very common, and usually this is where this is what has been necessitated us doing this particular segment. Is because most of you out there, when you hear the word lumbar puncture, you actually want to run and get under the bed because you're scared. Because people think that lumbar puncture is a death sentence, it is actually not a death sentence. And um, for me, in my practice, I have done several, several lumbar punctures. I have never, ever seen a person die from a lumbar puncture. I haven't. I am yet to see a person die from a lumbar puncture. Most people that I have seen die from lumbar puncture have died because of the disease. 
And uh, for me, this one is a myth. There you have it. We have been discussing lumbar puncture and all its issues. I hope that after this episode, you have been fully oriented, that some of the concerns or fears you had, um, you are now clarified and that you'd actually go out and teach some of your relatives and friends. And please, please spread the word. Lumbar puncture is actually safe. Until next time, this has been Ask Dr. Mjajati with me, your host, Dr. Mjajati. Do take care and continue to drink water. And carefully, these are children who are born without a brain. Literally, there is no brain. And these babies, when they are born, they die within the first few hours. So the child is born. They may cry or may not cry. Within two to three hours, the child is dead. The other issues that may arise is issues to do with um, you do not attend antenatal and you are not being given a, a very simple and very, very, very inexpensive supplement, folic acid. You end up or you end up having a child who has birth defects. This episode of Ask Dr. Mujajati was brought to you by Mika Group of Hotels. A Kazadi Films Original.